Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Maggie. So we'll um, give a bit of a teaching tonight. Um, so and we'll do some meditations again. So for those who've been here the previous weeks, we will do um, the Buddha meditation at the end, but we'll also do some other um, breathing type meditations as well. So um, tonight, I just really wanted to talk about you know, our med meditation and why we meditate and really about our minds and our, how our minds really are th what impacts us in our lives, in our day-to-day -day life. And often it's the wrong minds or minds that aren't very helpful to us, um, that are a bit out of control, um, that cause us our suffering. And that meditation is really about taking some control of your mind. Um, also first about getting to know your mind, getting to know how it works, and then being able to bring your mind to a much more natural state or a neutral state. And then also you can create other positive mental states. So there's lots of different types of meditation and there's lots of different, um, you know, they have a different outcome or a different impact on our mind. Um, but so it's really understanding our mind and how we can either overcome mind states that aren't help helpful with a direct antidote or how we can rest in our mind and experience its natural state which is much more truer sense of who we are and where we can come from or we all meditation can help us develop really positive mental states like um, love and compassion that again bring us a lot closer to who our natural state rather than all of these kind of defilements uh, as they would say in Dharma. So often we are, we, we, we really do start, our, our mind is really caught in a much exaggerated mental states often and it help, it, we create a lot of problems, a lot of delusions and a lot of drama for ourselves um, because of these mental states. And so yeah, meditation is really about getting back some of that control. Um, and I, just the other day, I mean, I had this experience with somebody um, where somebody had told me a message. I'd rung somebody and given them a message about something being cancelled. And then I got a message back saying, oh, they didn't listen to you. They're going to go ahead anyway because of this and this. And then I saw a person related to that, to that person, not that, not the person who actually I thought sent this text message or sent the text message. And then this anger arose in me and I said, so why did you, why did you cut me out? Why did you do that? Why did you go over the top of me? You know, this sort of anger just came out and this poor person was really confused and dazed and, and, then I, and I thought, oh, that was a bit, just sort of came out. And then I apologised later to that person and I went back to the person who told me the message, oh, they're, they're, they're not listening to you, they're just going to do it anyway. He read the text message and it wasn't even that. It was totally something different. So here I was, this poor, innocent person had been on the receiving end of my anger because I really believed they'd done something to me, they'd cut me out, you know. And it was totally fabricated within my mind. But at the time when this anger, I was with this person and it just arose. I thought, how dare they just cut me out? I, I rung them and I told them it wasn't on and they just ignored me. And, this, ugh, and I just, just said, well, I don't know why you cut me out. You know? And this anger arose. And then when I found out, they didn't even do that thing. Like, it didn't even have to happen for me to believe it to happen, for this idea in my mind to happen, this feeling, you know, and then for me to then say something. I mean, I just said, I don't know why you need to ignore me. And, and I thought there was nothing. From their side, nothing. You know, that's the sort of drama that we are engaging in all of the time. And, and she might have said something and there might have been a reason, whatever. But it just, it struck me as a bit embarrassing anyway, but because there was nothing from their side. The text message, somebody relayed me this text message totally wrong. So it was all just made up. 
nothing happened, but I still got angry. I still upset somebody and it was all for nothing. So, you know, in a way that's how we are operating a lot of our lives on that, on that kind of basis, you know. Our lives are often on the basis of an exaggerated mind. You know, I was so hurt, my pride hurt because they went over and above me, they didn't listen to me. Not that that even happened. Um, and they, you know, they were shocked because they even thought that I thought that. But you know, I could be hurt from nothing, from me thinking that that's what happened. You know, and and so this is what we have to examine. How did that happen? How could I hurt somebody? I was rude. How could I hurt somebody when nothing happened? So where, what happened? You know, it all happened in my mind. You know, and, and my quickness to anger. You know, so that's, we have to see how we're in, caught in a drama. You know, and, we, and we can examine how we are contributing to the drama of our lives or, and to other people's lives. Um, because that, that is the unhappy state of mind. It was very unha it was, I felt very uncomfortable and embarrassed. And, I, and, I, and, I, and somebody was really hurt and put out, you know, so like I was able to apologise and we, we've been friends for a long time, that's okay, but you know, this is really the basis of a lot of our drama and unhappiness is really based on a misunderstanding or an exaggerated point of view or that my ego, I feel so put out, you know, and even if um, there is a reason, we're so quick to judge, we're so quick to project our own um, self into that situation, you know, so, um, and that's how our minds are operating all of the time and we lose sight that um, there's, a, there's, from our side, we just seem to project and colour over it and, and we don't really understand that and we, and we, ha and we don't really unpack that. So meditation is, is also about trying to unpack that and to really reflect on how much was just fabricated, how much of our drama in our life is a fabrication, is our total projection. You know, my mind is the mind that's quick to anger. And so when there was a reason for my mind to create this feeling, this feeling of indignation, that then I projected on, onto the person who actually had nothing, you know, who didn't even send this supposed text. Um, you know, because it, it arose in me, so, and it was, she didn't say anything to me. She just sat there. But something in my mind, this story came up. Oh yeah, I'm annoyed about that. I must tell her how annoyed I am. You know, so my mind had this quick to anger. You know, so that, that, that's not, you know, I could have, so yeah, that's from my side. It was my mind that was quick to anger. So that's really something we have to understand about my mind um, because we've got a choice. You know, I, I, didn't, I don't have to be angry and also even if, and I don't have to act on my anger. You know, whether something happened or not, that's regardless. In this case, nothing happened and I got angry. So it shows you that anger actually doesn't really need a valid object to be angry about. It just, if your mind is habituated to anger, it, it will, will arise. And it was my thought that said, oh, that person reminded me of that incident that that happened, and then my anger arose. She didn't, she didn't say anything. My anger arose because I saw her and it triggered a thought, which triggered another thought, which triggered anger, and, and then I expressed that to her. So again, we have to understand how it is our own mind that's creating and projecting and um, getting caught in this sort of cycle of creating anger. And the more anger you um, generate, or whatever delusion it is, the more your mind will be habituated to it. So again, you just get quicker and quicker. And the more you act on it, and the less you examine it, and, 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 and can reflect on yourself and say, oh, what happened there? 
You know, let, let me really take, break this down, let me think about that. Um, and that is the process, that is the process of an analytical meditation. Because you're, you're engaging your mind on reflecting on your own mind in a way that's helping break down those negative mental states. Because the more they come, the more uncontrollable they get, you know. And so the more control we can get on them is the more we can stop ourselves you know, because when our delusions arise, they are like that trigger. Something will trigger us. And we'll say or do, or, or, or you know, it could be jealousy, it could be pride. And there, there's probably a few operating, for me, pride, um, anger. Um, so it's really about understanding how we generate these mind states within ourselves. And part of it is, well, the most part it is, because we, we really do believe that externally our world, even though that unhappy state of mind was totally generated in me, and that's why I thought it was a really good example, because it appeared nothing happened, but I still was able to generate something happening, and I still acted as if something had happened, and it had an impact. But, you know, sometimes something does happen. Sometimes somebody does say something could does something um, that might be harmful but we still have a choice we still have a choice that we we don't have to get angry you know or we don't have to um, f you know have a certain re reaction we can control our minds you know we can have some control over how we respond in that way and so I think it, it really does become because we do believe the, the external world is, is how we act with the external world. We actually think it's coming from the external world to us and that this subject, a, object, agent sort of thing is happening where we don't see how much our mind is really part of, of that creation. And, and I think especially with, with even happiness, we really do believe that happiness comes from external material objects that and those material objects in in and of themselves provide us happiness just as that external object of my friend i felt at the time in and of herself caused me harm and again why well, i think it's a good example because she caused me no harm and i think it's a good example of how she did nothing but still I had created this story and had told her, I don't know why you ignored me or cut me out. I had this sort of feeling, but nothing happened from her side. But we really do act in, in, our, in our world that a, a material object or person, separate from ourselves, in and of themselves, can give us a sense of happiness or unhappiness with an, us, with, with not influenced by how we perceive or how we react or, or how our, our mind is controlled towards that object. And, and that is really, I, I think, you know, why we get so caught up in drama over time and how we really just keep building, building, building on that drama. Because we never stop to reflect, okay, well, what's really going on? How much is coming from my side completely and how much is am I then buying into that drama? And then I do act out, and then it creates even more drama that comes back at me even stronger. So your, our minds will come back at us even stronger if we keep acting on it. You know, so, you know, our external world does give us a source of happiness, obviously. We, we need people, and, and we need food and shelter, and, and we need, you know, we have basic material needs. But when we think of our basic material needs, for us in the West, definitely, they are met probably 99.9% .9 of the time. You know, we don't go hungry or cold. Um, and we're, so we're fairly well looked after materially. So if, if it was true that those material external objects or people were to give us 
our happiness, or they were happiness, intrinsically happy, causing things, then we would certainly be happy now, you know. And the same object that we thought could give us happiness today or tomorrow would then always give us happiness. So we have an expectation of, of our material world and of the people within it, but they have to deliver to us a certain amount of happiness, a certain amount of um, satisfaction, and, that, and we believe that that shouldn't change. So again, we act towards that object as if that's true. You know, So if I only have that object, then I will be happy. And then so we can become very focused on that idea of this object. If I have that object, I will be happy. And if I have that object, I will be happy. And then we can start obsessing about that, that object and very, become very focused on that object. And again, we can have to think, well, what's happening in our mind? And so within our mind, that's where we seem to have this idea of, of craving and grasping for that object. So um, the more that we focus on that object of bringing a source of happiness, the more craving and grasping we'll have for that object. And then same, the more of an object that we think is out there that's going to give us untold suffering, we don't want it, we don't like that person because they said or did something. Um, we really want to push them away. We really want to be, we just, or we want to spend our time generating this kind of anger state towards them talking about them, pointing out these features or these things they said or did do, um, which is mainly imagined as well. So again, we generate this idea of an aversion for that object and we keep exaggerating in our mind stream how horrible that object is. And so these states, going from one to the other, we either love an object or we, we have an aversion for the object or we completely neutral, but it's the aversion and the attachment and the desire for an object and we sort of bounce around these states. And then we keep our craving and grasping for the ones we want, we keep building up on that in our mind. And then we finally get the object, it, and it might bring us a bit of happiness, it certainly might be something we want or, or need, or brings us some happiness. But then after a while, the happiness starts to wane, but then we've already moved on to another object. And then again, we start to project onto that object. It needs to give us a level of happiness. And around and around we go. So we tend to, this is again how our mind works. And so that's what we have to un try and understand. Is that true for me? You know, is it true? Can we, is anger arising in our mind? Is desire and attachment in our mind? Do we get caught up? obsessively thinking about something that we need or want or obsessing about somebody we dislike or don't like because of something they did. How is our mind state? What are our mind doing? You know, so it can go either way, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so, and when we kind of think that's normal, we kind of think, well that's kind of normal and we try and have, as long as we have enough objects that we like in our lives and enough, and we stay away from those we dislike, we're kind of okay. But if we really under see our mind and understand how our mind is really generating these states, and that we feel we don't have a choice about that, we feel that that's just how it is, that's our mind, you know, we just jump from one to the other and the other, we just one experience to the other, or one anxiety to the other, or one. Um, failed relationship to the other. We just think, well, that's just how it is. That's just life, you know, that's just happening to me. You know, it's happening to me. This is my life. So we, we don't, you know, it's about how we can start to get a bit of insight into see our role in this, our role in the theatre of our mind, of our lives. Um, and so that's why we, um, we really want to meditate to just, just sort of first stop so we can get a break from that kind of constant delusional states within our mind. We can actually get some space and watch them dissipate. So then when they do happen, we actually can see it played out quite clearly. 
And then we can say, oh, that's really interesting. You know, I, I can see what I did, how my part in it, how I exaggerated, how then I acted out, you know. So that, that's where we can then begin to take a bit of control over our minds. Or if we feel we're always grasping and craving for an object, we can start to settle the mind. And it's okay to want objects and, and to experience material happiness. It's just understanding that relationship. If it's a healthy relationship and the expectation is that um, it gives some kind of satisfaction, but it's not this lasting satisfaction, it's not this grasping at it as something that's going to, you know, improve your status or, you know, we actually what's underneath is this idea that these objects will somehow make me better. You know, like that I got angry because I felt I was, I was insulted, I, I was treated badly. You know, so our anger and our, our delusions and our desires are really a come back to how we feel about this self-cherishing, self-grasping mind. And so it's really that, that strong self-cherishing, strong self-grasping that is really driving a lot of these mental states. And when these mental states are getting out of control and then we act. And so again, if we can start to think about when we can start to calm those mental states down that we are just reacting to all the time, we can then start to look at the ego and how it's the ego that's driving. I want this, if I have this, I will be thought, people will look at me and I'll be, have more status. Or they will think highly of me, you know. So it's really, that's what's driving behind those states and we get angry because people think oh they look down on us how dare you look down on me so it's very much this ego so we, we're looking for status and praise and we're looking we don't want to be blamed so it's really it's it's the ego that is driving that that mental drama but again, what's behind that ego? You know, that, that really self-cherishing mind. And, that, and again, that, so we can examine that. And, and that mind can seem like it's this inherent kind of Margie. And that and Margie wants to, to exist, she has to feel lifted up. She has to feel that she is special, you know, fame, name, you know. So we're always sort of looking for this reinforcement from a, our external world that I'm okay. You know, and then so if somebody attacks Margie, I'll quickly get angry. Because I'm protecting Margie. You know, and if somebody praises Margie, you know, I start to feel really good. So we can see how fragile this ego mind is because it doesn't take much out there, and I, 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 again, I'm not on social media, thank God, for people to have an opinion, to say you're not as great as you might be, and, and to bully or to, you know, earn everyone's got an opinion because they want to be famous or whatever. You know, so we can quickly, our ego, if we're just really dependent on what others think of us, and under, underneath what people think of us is our need, our ego need to be, to rise up, to be held up, to get and to get that validation. And so it comes very fragile. You know, and again, it will fill our mind with a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of interactions that are, are, are really fed by this ego grasping mind. And then when we don't get our needs met, we, we feel very withdrawn and very you know, it's sad. And when we get our needs met, we feel really happy and we keep, oh, I want that more, I need more of that, I need more of that. Ego feels good, ego feels good. So we're really driven by this sense of ego. And again, Margie exists, I'm sitting here, but does Margie really need to have this 
validation and reinforcement from others to actually exist and feel good about herself? Or is that, is that because I project out, is that coming from that or is it true? You know. And again, that's when we can sit in meditation and we can see that we can create a sense of self and a sense of happiness that's without that kind of heavy projection on an external world that then we need to feed back to ourselves. And that's even happening, that's happening like my example with getting angry, that happened with nothing from that side coming. It's, most of it's happening here. And then it is this driven, it's driven by this really sense of ego, this sense of eye grasping, this sense of I need to be validated, I need to be reinforced, that I'm good, that I'm not bad. And, if I, and, I, and then I'll get angry or I'll, I'll chase things based on that. So really meditation is giving yourself a bit of a break and getting some space. So you're not always in that kind of um, cycle, you know, and we call it cyclic existence. That's basically our existence, you know. And, um, you know, we can generally go along okay, but that's why we find our minds get very much wound up with thoughts and feelings because it's all about this pr projection out and, and ego, sort of ego-driven. So, um, yeah, meditation is this idea that it, it gives you a break. You don't, the ego doesn't like you meditating. That's probably why we don't do it. <laughs> you know, because, you know, we, they, we're sort of undermining the ego when we meditate. We're really stepping out of, of, of that. And that's very much projecting out. Um, If, if, we're, if our meditation's reinforcing our ego, oh, I'm doing this, aren't I good, aren't I great, I'm such a good meditator, aren't I wonderful? People think I'm so great because I meditate. We've got our meditation in our, our ego wrapped up in our meditation. Um, you know, so, and it's very subtle, our e even though we get in all sorts of messes, um, our ego does operate on a very subtle level, so it is tricky. But, um, yeah, the idea of meditation is to really give yourself a break and to give your mind some space and then bring your mind back down to a much more open, calm, spacious sort of state that's not this ego-driving state. Um, and, and it's really that simple, but it's not that simple, but, you know, that, that's the idea, yeah, that we're not... We're not taking ego in. We're trying to examine, examine our mind, see how the mind is operating, see how it could be ego-driven. And then, you know, when, with my example of anger, it, I can reflect on that and, and see easily that it's, um, you know, how, how dare they think that about me? You know, that, that hurt me that they would think that or override me or ignore what I, you know, had said or did or whatever, you know, and that's ego, I, how dare they, you, it's all ego, it's only ego. From a non-ego state, it, it doesn't matter what people do because you're not looking for the reinforcement from there to validate your ego's existence, so it wouldn't matter if everybody, you know, did insult you or didn't like you, it, it just wouldn't matter because you're not transacting, the transaction isn't there. The feedback, I need that feedback to feel good about myself, to validate who I am. You know, so when we go into meditation, it's not about validating, it's about kind of letting be. It's like just being in a state with your own mind. You know, it, it really is that, that break from ego. Okay. Um, just 
just check my notes. So I thought tonight we could do um, some short meditations, um, just breath, breathing type meditations. And again, with the idea of just being with your breath, being with your, or your mind, whichever, it doesn't matter. So you can just sit first, we can do a series of them. I'll, I think I'll keep them short to a minute or two minutes and I'll ring the gong. So the idea will be to sit the first time with just your mind and just be a watcher of your mind. Just be very much mindful, watching your mind, that's mindfulness, to watch, to be mindful on your mind. So use your mindfulness to look at your mind. And, and you know, there'll be lots of thoughts. Um, an ego might jump in and say, oh, am I doing this right? What are we doing here? I'm not sure what's doing here. And that's okay. That's fine. Just sit, just notice that. Okay, that's all right. But don't get in the dialogue of it. Oh, yes, I'm so bad at this. Oh, my goodness. Or I'm very distracted tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm, my mind's all over the place. It's okay. It's okay for us to have lots of thoughts in our mind because our minds are thinking machines. That's what they do. They think. They think thoughts. So, you know, then we don't have to judge them as a good or a bad thought. It's just thought. And we don't have to judge, oh, my mind has a lot of thoughts because minds have thoughts. So I think we can go into meditation with all these preconceived ideas about what it is and that we need to do something to be good at it. Again, that defeats the purpose of meditation because, again, our ego is involved. Our ego wants to say, I'm good at that meditation. And if, if we go in with that, I'm good or I, that was bad, that was good, then we're just, again, we're, we're transacting with our mind in a way that's setting, can, keeping that going. So we don't want to bring our worldly sorts of mind states that get us in a lot of trouble and overthinking into our meditation. So again, if you feel you're doing that, that's fine, but just let it go. Oh, that's what I'm doing here. I'm... And then see, oh, that's how that works. You know, it's about that awareness, being aware of what you are, just being open awareness and let everything come and go in your mind without the judging and without the, the like, the dislike, without the good, the bad. You know, that, that's, that's the kind of ego game. It's just, it's just mind. Mind has thoughts and you don't have to think good or bad thoughts. And it's just awareness. So your awareness, your mind is aware, and then you're aware of, so your mind can be aware of your thoughts. So we experience our whole world through our mind. And it's about being aware of that. Again, we think we experience this table because it's this red table that's ex external from my mind. But it's my mind that is experiencing, apprehending this object. You know, so the object exists in my mind as this red table. And so that's awareness. My mind can contact this object and know that this is a red table. It's got sides and a back and that. So that's the awareness, knowing an object. So mindfulness is being mindful, keeping our concentration, keeping our mind aware, and awareness is any object. So a thought is an object of our mind. You know, this table, when I think about it, is an object of my mind. And I can't experience the table unless it's an object of my mind. So again, to have no thoughts in, in our mind or our meditation, it, it doesn't work because, um, especially at the beginning, Thoughts are just part of our mind. Our minds cognize, our minds think. Our minds contact objects and then those objects appear. And then we make a story and, and create, interact with them and we create memories and then, and then we keep that story going. So again, it's not about keeping the story going, it's about just being open with our mind. 
and, aware, and being aware of, of mind. You know, thoughts come out of the mind and go and, and disappear. So that it's fine, it's really relaxed when, when there's thoughts in the mind. Um, it's also, if you find you've got lots and lots of thoughts in the mind and you're getting into the shopping list and worrying about the day or what happened and you are in a bit of the drama, that's fine too. Another way to do that in meditation then is to use the breath. Because the mind always looks for an object. Again, our mind wants an object and it will always, and it will, gross minds will look for more gross minds. So if we, if we attack, attach our mind to the breath, again it can hold the mind. It, it, our mind does like an object. So the breath is a good object to meditate on because it can just, you can think, I'm thinking here, oh, I'll come back to the breath. So it, you, it gives your mind a focal point. So it's a good, it's a good place when, when you're beginning to have, to have a focal point. So, and, and that way you can bring your mind back without, again, judgment or that, oh, I'm on the shopping list, or oh, I'm thinking about tomorrow, or oh, that person's annoying me. Okay, I, I'm there, and then bring it back to the breath. Or, if a thought comes, then just let the thought go, because if, another thing, if you concentrate on the thought, um, even if the thought has a lot of energy, oh, I really hate that person, um, if you then try and focus on that thought, the thought will disappear. The thought can't last more than a few seconds. So if you, if you then try and penetrate that thought in your meditation, then you'll see that there is no thought. So that, that's another way you can meditate. But if you engage the thought, oh yeah, I do hate that person, then you're engaging that thought and you're building that thought, you're building the next thought, building the next, and you're building onto that thought. But if you try and penetrate that thought, hold that thought, see if that thought exists, it, it will naturally subside. And so by concentrating on the breath, the breath is a very neutral object and it's very, and the mindfulness and the concentration in your mind, it will open and relax your mind from all of those busy, transactional, ego-driven mind states. Again, if you just sit in meditation with an open mind and just see the thoughts come and go, again, you're giving your mind that break from, from that sort of normal, mind states that we're in. So you're giving yourself some peace of mind. And then later you can then, because you've got a bit of break and a bit of space in your mind, you can start to see how, how the ego, when you give yourself a bit of a break from the ego, you can start to see when it comes up stronger, strong. And anger or desire, attachment, that's when they're really strong. That's when you can see the ego's driving driving you stronger or when you get really feelings very hurt that's that's that sense that maybe that's the ego all right so we'll do um some guided meditation well no we'll do some meditations on the breath on the mind i'll guide you through then i'm going to ring the gong after a minute or two and then you can relax your mind because Again, meditation takes energy and takes focus, it takes concentration and mindfulness and they're mental factors that we really, our modern world isn't priming us for because we're always doing this. And I, I think at, at work I would see so many different emails with so many different <laughs> topics at me all the time, like our minds are just going bing, 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 bing and then someone comes in, the phone rings and you follow up that email our minds are very distracted. You no, know, they're just jumping from one thing, and then we check this, and then we ring. Oh, I've got to ring that person. I've got to go there. So our minds are always very distracted, very busy. So again, meditation is about it's about the opposite, about mindfulness and introspection, um, concentration, are trying to focus our mind. So again, we might find that hard in this in this modern world because our attention span is 
is reducing. Um, because we don't multitask, what we do is we flip between tasks in very short, short spans. You know, we flip to one, flip to one, flip to one, flip to one. And, you know, that is really bad for our attention and concentration. So that is why when we meditate, we find we get quickly distracted. You know, our mind will start flipping and thinking. And we're very much primed to that. So again, that's why I think really 30 seconds, um, 60 seconds at the beginning is enough. If you can hold that without losing that object, even for 20, 30 seconds, you're doing really, really well. And then and you build from that. Um, you know, because we are, in a way, our minds are very much... Um, our modern world isn't conducive um, to, to having a calm, relaxed mental state, really. Um, too busy. All right. All right. So um, we can start now. So sit in your meditation posture. Um, just make it on the a chair or on the floor. That's fine. Um, just make sure your back is straight. That's the most important thing. Um, maybe if you want to take some deep breaths, and um, when you're breathing out, just um, breathe out all of your distracted minds. And, and then set an intention that you're going to spend the next minute or so um, sitting with your mind or using your mindfulness to keep your mind on the breath. And you're going to really have, have strong intent. So the stronger your intent, the more likely you're going to, to do it and be very clear. And set that goal and then let go, no, no judgment, nothing. Just say that's what your intention is. And then whatever happens in your meditation, as long as you can see how it went without judgment, but understand how it went, then it's been successful. Even if it was for five seconds, it was still, if you then caught your mind going off and you bring your mind back on, then you can keep meditating, that's fine. It might go off the object onto thoughts, you notice it, you bring it back on. That's really all you have to do. And it's okay if, you, if your thoughts get carried away, that's fine, but it's good to, your mindfulness catches it and you bring it back on the, and puts it back on the object, your attention back onto the object. So we'll start with that one.
So just come out of that meditation, keep your eyes closed if you want to open them if you want and just quickly just review your meditation. Just relax your mind a bit. Again, if you got caught up in the chatter, that's fine. Now we'll go back into the meditation. So again, set your intention strongly on the meditation that you're going to spend another minute with your mindfulness and introspection just and your awareness it's awareness of the mind or awareness of the breath. So again, just have a bit of a rest. <clears throat> Relax your mind a bit. You can critique your meditation if you want, what you did well. what you learnt about that meditation. And now f that meditation's finished, so now we get ready for the next meditation. And again, just commit to spending the next one minute trying to keep your mind on your breath or just being aware of the mind, letting the thoughts come and go without any, without getting involved in them.
Now I'll just move into the Buddha Shakyamuni meditation. So this is a visualization. And this meditation is really about generating love um, and receiving love from the Buddha and also giving it to all sentient beings. So above the crown of your head, imagine Buddha Shakyamuni or the Buddha. He is seated on a lotus throne which has a sun and a moon cushion. And these symbolizes the three principal realizations of the path to enlightenment, renunciation, bodhicitta and emptiness. The so Buddha is golden in color. His body is filled with light that radiates out in all directions. He has black hair, which has a top knot. He has a beautiful face. His eyes are half opened and gazing out. He is seated on a lotus in a lotus posture, and he's wearing the saffron robe monks of a monk. He has a begging bowl in his left hand, and he is touching the ground with his right hand in the gesture of meditative concentration. The Buddha is very beautiful. He smiles serenely with his compassionate gaze towards you and all other living beings. So you can imagine all living beings, all your friends and family, neighbors, colleagues, all sitting around you, all strangers, all sorts of beings are surrounding you. So feel the presence of the Buddha. Remember his perfect qualities and his willingness to help you. And request Buddha to help you to become free from all your negative energy, ignorance and problems and to receive all the realizations of the path to enlightenment. The Buddha accepts your requests. And so then visualize rays of light stream down from the Buddha and entering to your crown completely filling your body and purifying you and all the beings around you of all the negativities and bestowing all blessings and realizations. So the nectar represents the blessings from the Buddha's mind in the forms of light. And Buddha has, his mind is of bliss, nature, free of all defilements and obscurations, or ego grasping. So feel yourself blessed with that mind stream. And feel the light from the Buddha going out to all beings surrounding you into their crown and also blessing them.
So now the Buddha dissolves into light above the crown of your head and descends down through your crown to your heart. And there his blessings of mind stream become inseparable with your body, speech and mind, the holy body, speech and mind of the Buddha. And we dedicate, may the merits accumulated through engaging in this meditation become a cause to quickly attain the ultimate state of a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So when you're ready, you can come out of your meditation. And if anybody had any questions, we've got five minutes or so for questions. Yep. Ah, um, the qu question was um, for me to elaborate on penetrating thought. Um, yep. So our minds are um, changing momentary. Each moment they change. So if you have a thought arise and then with your attention, your focus, your awareness, you, like the thought will arise and it comes from the mind and we think it's a permanent sort of thought. Our belief is that it's a permanent thought. So if we then try to find that thought it can't be found because it's gone. So we try to find it, we try to locate, we try to hold on to that thought. But the thought isn't a, how it appears to our mind, which is like a permanent thought. It, it can't be found. And also the mind, it's momentary. So by the time we try and hold it, it's gone. So what we do is that we have one thought, then we have another thought, then we have another thought, and we string them together to create a story. But if you're just watching the thoughts, not creating the story, if you're watching them, then they'll, you can begin to see that they come and go. So that's why if you focus on them, not on the story, but on the actual thought, it can't, it can't be found It'll, because it's gone. So it's already passed. Another one might come up, but then you again focus on that. So you keep trying to focus on the thought. It's sort of like water in a stream. You know, if you were sitting up from an edge of a creek and you thought, I want to follow that bit of water, the water's rushing. The water, there's not, the water that's there in front of you always is not the water, it's not the same water. It's a continual stream of water. So a thought can come and go. So there's a, a stream of consciousness, but the, the water that was there, two seconds later it's there, and then it's there. That, so the thoughts are gone, but the mind stream is moving. 
So that, that's how mind stream is impermanent and it's moving. So we can sit in awareness of that without engaging the thoughts, because our thoughts we see as very permanent, as very reflecting back on us. Mm. Yeah, so um, just see how that goes. Yeah, if you try and focus, find find that thought. You know, it's and and think of it as like sitting at on the river bed or the creek bed. Find that find that water. That water. That water. It's a stream. Yeah. It's a stream, and it's a stream of consciousness, and our thoughts will come out of that consciousness. Consciousness is um, just clear and knowing. It's it's just knowing its object. Any other questions? Alrighty. Okay, thank you everybody. Thanks for your attention and your wonderful meditation. Um, there is a cup of tea and a cake if you'd like in the dining room or um, yep. otherwise thank you and um, we'll see you again. Bye bye.